Welcome. I'm Andrew Nuska, Fortune's digital editor and one of the co-chairs of Fortune's Brainstorm Tech Conference, scheduled to be in person in gorgeous Half Moon Bay, California, please note, <laughs> on November 30th and December 1st. We hope you'll all join us. Big thanks today to Three Pillar Global and KPMG for being our corporate partners for today's event. This session is part of a series of Brainstorm Tech virtual events that we plan to have leading up to the actual in-person conference you all know and love from November 30th again to December 1st. Watch your inbox for news on other upcoming sessions through the year. All right, before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes. Today's gathering is on the record and will be covered by Fortune journalists. We'd love to have audience questions. So you can just enter those in the chat function and I will read them uh, 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 during the discussion. We'll make sure the moderator sees them and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Please uh, have at it. These discussions are much richer when you all chime in. So please do, you all know how Zoom meetings can be. And with that, I'll hand things over to senior writer and conference co-chair Lucinda Shen to kick off the first of our two discussions today. Lucinda. Thank you, Andrew. Um, hi, everybody. So our first session today is going to be about a new era for product development and the reality that collaboration is now more important than ever these days in tech. So it's much more than just about UX. Joining us today, we have an all-star team. Um, if you all don't mind just giving a quick wave whenever I give, give your names off. Um, our guests are Mike Moreska, Global Chief Technology Officer at Walgreens, um, Ian Roberts, COO of IDEO, David Sawatsky, Chief Delivery Officer of Three Pillar Global, and Haiyan Zhang, Chief Staff, Chief of Staff Xbox over at Microsoft. So thank you all for being with us today. So I will go ahead and kick it off with a question um, for you, Mike, because I think it's really pertinent at this moment, given the COVID crisis that we talk about the healthcare system. And I think Walgreens has very much been at the center of that. What makes it even more fascinating at, is as the uh, chief technology officer, Mike, you were thrown into right into the middle of digital transformation. You joined Walgreens in the summer of 2020. So uh, really in the heat of that. So tell us a little more about what you've been working on at Walgreens in your position and what that's meant for the company that has really largely been known for its in-store operations. Yeah, it's, um, uh, hello everyone, it's good to be here with everyone. Um, uh, Mike Moraska from Walgreens Boots Alliance, as was indicated, I've been uh, in role in chair for about six months now and it's been, um, it's been an incredible introduction to uh, an amazing company. Um, I, uh, it has been certainly um, uh, unnatural times with the pandemic and in many ways, I think what we've, we've experienced through that as an essential business is it's intensified some of the challenges that we had, but also amplified some of the opportunities. The challenges of switching a workforce over to, um, in some cases, being remote when you talk about our IT department, but also um, uh, what we've had to do in terms of, you know, for our, our workers on the front line, our pharmacists, our teams in the stores, for them to make sure that we have a safe work environment. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been a challenge, but also an opportunity for us to uh, connect more across our teams. Um, it's also amplified uh, opportunities around how we serve the customer better. Um, you know, as we think about that customer experience, which is so top of mind today, where, you know, people are worried about their individual health, their family's health, it's really kind of amplified kind of what I think has been a strong presence in our communities as a trusted, um, a trusted uh, member of the health community. Um, So um, we, we cherish that opportunity to serve our, our communities better and really be on the front lines of, of, of using, you know, figuring out how our technology can enhance customers' health, but also, um, you know, as part of their experiences um, as they engage our stores, but also some new capabilities that we've actually introduced, uh, whether it be buy online and pick up in store. Um, we have an industry leading uh, 30 minutes um, once you play through we're able to meet that need um, within our stores in, in new ways. So it's, uh, it's been challenging times, but um, I think you know, the Walgreens culture of the team um, has really risen to the occasion. And um, like I said, we've, I, I, it, it's amplified um, what has already been an amazing uh, company and their tradition in terms of being able to serve our communities. 
so you actually broke up a little for me, Mike, when you said something about 30 minutes and being able to serve that that time limit. Can you repeat what you were trying to say there? Yeah, so a new capability. Uh, once the football traffic um, kind of went down as part of some of the lockdowns, we uh, we rapidly mobilized the team to, to develop an online, buy online pickup and store capability, so curb store pickup. Um, and you get back to that product agile mindset. It was really kind of that close collaboration with the business, understanding what the needs of our customers were in the stores or as they um, actually want to interact with our teams in the stores differently. Uh, we rolled that out and um, you know, 30 minutes from order to when it's ready. Um, that's something that we're pretty proud of and uh, we're getting good reviews back from our customers that it's, it's a valuable service. So it's just one of those ways that we've innovated um, through these challenging times. Great, I wanna get back to a little later, but um, I wanted to first kind of pivot. So um, Ian, you also have a similar experience in a way. So you um, have worked with Ford quite heavily on the product development side. And uh, one thing that Ford has been able to do recently, so they, uh, I believe made about 2.4 million face shields while um, on the product line, even though that a lot of the car factories are closed. And so they were able to do these 2.4 million face shields within a period of two and a half weeks, which speaks a lot about that ability to, to move quickly. And so can you tell me a little more about that as well? Yeah, sure. I mean, that was led out of a, a group that we helped build within Ford Motor Company called D-Ford, which is part of a journey that they've been on to try and embed, uh, I mean, Mike mentioned product thinking, design thinking, product thinking, like the, the idea of actually fundamentally embracing that kind of a toolkit inside of an organization so that you can move with agility, right? Move with purpose and get things done a lot quicker, frankly, and have a higher, higher order of impact. So I think that wouldn't have happened without the existence of DeFord. What it allowed Ford as an organization to do is really begin to silo bust and say, fundamentally, we're bringing an organization together around a core mission that extends beyond the day-to-day -day business of quarterly earnings, starts fundamentally to say, this is a challenge we're going after. We can kind of organize around, in that case, who's the user, right? These were frontline workers we're trying to actually fundamentally put protection uh, around and it allowed them to move at pace. Uh, and it's, it's, I think, one of my proudest moments of working with Ford is seeing their ability to take a design function that was built to do one thing very well, design products and services and digital experiences for, for, for the automotive space and the mobility space and pivot it really quickly to say, how can we build uh, ventilators? How can we build PPE? How can we use our capacity and our capabilities as an enterprise to do things that we didn't imagine was possible? That kind of agility, I think it's incredibly extensible uh, across different categories and uh, really great to see. That's great. Um, so that's a great way of kind of moving to um, high end as well in your work at Xbox. So Microsoft has really kind of doubled down on gaming and they've done a lot recently, which is in the pandemic as well. Um, they acquired, uh, I'm sorry, the company behind Bethesda, Dynamax, um, which creates games like Fallout and Skyrim. So within product development, right, there's creating the product and then there's also the acquisition strategy. So I would, you know, when do you decide that it's time to buy an out of, uh, out of house firm versus building it within? Um, yes, thanks, uh, Lucinda, that's a great question. Uh, I would say that we are, we are parallel pathing um, and I think our focus is really on, um, you know, at Xbox we're building an ecosystem to empower more people to play, whether that's on the console, on PC, on mobile, on any of their devices, and uh, enabling people to play wherever they are and um, wherever they are in the world. Um, and so we look at our strategy as, you know, we've got this 20 year history of building amazing games like Halo, Forza, um, in recent years, uh, Minecraft, and how can we expand our range of games and our portfolio to support even more 
play patterns, more ways that people can play. So um, sometimes that means uh, building a creative team from scratch. Um, in a lot of cases, we know there's great creators out there. Um, Bethesda, Zenimax, you know, an amazing brand, amazing set of studios uh, building iconic games. Um, and in that case, it was just, everything just kind of came together and it was a great opportunity for us. But we are also thinking about creators out there who are making games and how can we, as an ecosystem, as a business, support them, whether that's through um, enabling them to uh, share their games with the world uh, through our partnership program, or um, potentially, you know, if it made sense for acquisition, that um, that's a route that we are looking at as well. So it's a mix of everything. You think that they're kind of the creativity comes from within the company as well as outside. Yeah, I think um, I think the first and foremost question we would ever ask is, are we a better home for any creator? Is it what is the best um, path forward for that creator? Do they want to be, are they more better independently and launching games within our ecosystem and other ecosystems? Or do we think that we would be a better owner? Um, so uh, I think in every case where that's kind of the thing, the thing, the hat that we put on when we're thinking through these um, uh, uh next um uh stages right um that's actually a fa fantastic point for me to kind of segue over into our next uh speaker as well because zoom has taken on kind of the strategy as well with allowing other companies to proliferate on its platform even as it's become both uh well loved and and a little irritating <laughs> in this pandemic and so um there is for those of you with kids out there you might be familiar with a, a startup called class edu that is funded by some of Zoom's earliest backers. And so David, you have worked quite closely with a company, even though you too only joined your company in the summer of last year. Um, and that was around product development as well. And so I wanted to hear a little more from your side as well about moving quickly um, because so many other companies at the same time are going after the same space. Yeah, no, it's it's a fascinating time to join. And I'm, I'm quite lucky to be there. Like Mike, I joined in, you know, in the summer of COVID. Uh, which is the least time you think you'd be changing a job. But at the same time, I think I ended up at probably the best company at the, at the right time, right? Digital transformation is on its way, digital product and the, and the requirement to do things faster and newer with the whole, you know, all the disruption going on with so many industries. Um, you, you mentioned Zoom. We're working with a, with a client that's got a great idea of how to build some custom specific apps, some products that they can create new markets, a competitive advantage and get to get to that market very quickly. Um, and they came to us and said, hey, we've got a great idea. We've got, we've got the right people invested. We need your help to build it. And we built a great relationship with them and we've done it at an incredibly fast speed, but with the idea that all products innovate for life. I mean, they, 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 as long as they're chosen by their clients and continue to kind of self-fund, they're gonna need more innovation. So as we work with this client, and many other clients, there's this, they've, they, they, we're kind of getting that first view out there so they can get to market fast, but we've, got, we've built it with the idea that we're gonna be able to add new features and functions and, you know, look for new disruptions that haven't happened yet. And it's just, it's the right time to be here. It's it just really exciting. Well, that kind of brings me to the other theme, I think that all of our speakers have brought up, which is understanding what the customer wants. And so that has come with a plethora of data. Um, the pandemic has come with a plethora of data. And so David, within the context of Class EDU, um, tell me a little more about the kinds of data that you're seeing out of there. How are you getting, uh, getting better to understand your customers and what they want, what do they want? Yeah, well, I mean, a, a lot of it, we, we, we preach the concept of the product mindset, right? So we understand with the client what they want to get to, and then from that, build out the product that, you know, will, is what really fits their needs. I grew up, spent most of my years at IBM building co um, commercial off the self product, which was not custom and needed a ton of uh, enhancements and, and, and integration work. And, you know, within six months was out of date. Our intent is to build products that can leverage data platforms can leverage, you know, see patterns that are out there uh, and can evolve and change and innovate based on what's going on in the marketplace. So we're doing, we did that with, with, with the class EDU on where, where they are and we're using, you know, new mobile app type approaches to things that, you know, really leverage what our kids, right, are using on a day-to-day -day basis and try to build to a better experience. I mean, we talked a little bit about UX, but a lot of it is about that experience. How do we build the right product that gives the right experience for that client? Because you know, I mean, we're all using Zoom, so I want to be very careful what we say here, because um, we're we're all. I mean, it's made our lives easier, but at the same time, if we could build something a little bit better for specific niches, um, they would be very, very powerful. And we're working with the client to help them to get the most out of the data that they're seeing come into their into their digital product. 
So we're going to have a lot of different versions of Zoom. I'm, well, I'm not going to, we're just here to help. <laughs> but, it's, awesome. but we are, it, it, it is, there's a lot of neat opportunities that are happening. Unfortunately, I mean, COVID is the worst thing that's ever happened to us. That personally, I think everyone, no one, no one person has not suffered, but from a business, there's been a huge amount of opportunity. Um, and we're lucky enough in our company to be able to help our clients uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, and Mike, I think that trend speaks really well for Walgreens as well. There's been a trend around mass personalization within healthcare, a topic that I think Walgreens and you probably understand very well um, as you've been trying to transform the company in a, in a more tech forward way. Um, so what does that mean in ter right now, right? What kinds of personalization can we expect? What do people want and how are you able to understand what, what your customers want? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and first I have to talk about some of the, the kind of the foundational investments we're making in order to enable that. So we are investing quite heavily in the cloud strategic relationship with Microsoft um, that, was, um, that we put in place two years ago. Uh, we couldn't really kind of rise to the challenge, the agility without the power of the cloud. The second is around um, just kind of the new ways of working. We've had to respond to a very changing fluid environment. If you think about just the, the, you know, the implementation of testing services and then on top of that, the vaccine services, the ways of working, you know, but also the ability to drive what I would call those deep insights into some of those experiences, even as we're trying to figure those out, whether it be you know, as changing requirements come through through the government or just, just kind of market conditions. Um, we, we've really started investing both in our mass personalization platform. So um, data and analytics capabilities, we're trying to go from um, a company that is best in class. We think that's the best way to actually um, drive better customer experiences and eventually better customer or patient outcomes. So that, that's, those have been foundational uh, to, to what we're doing, not only do we have to do the cloud and the power that it provides with it, but how data can actually can enhance the customer experience uh, with the overlay of a product oriented mindset, which allows us to iterate quickly to a solution that really serves our customers well. So that, that's been the challenge, but also the opportunity. Right. Well, how are you, there's kind of also this question between um, personalization and data privacy as well. And so how do you toe the line? What, what is the line there so that you still keep your customers happy and comfortable with the fact that they're giving you information and yeah. you're still able to iterate on your product? Yeah, that, and that's a, that's a line we walk very, very, um, um, deliberately, right? We really have three, three platforms or ecosystems within Walgreens. We've got retail, we got the pharmacy, and we have a healthcare capability. We, um, there's government regulations in terms of how we can mash those data, that data together. So we're very careful, um, but we do think there's opportunities to serve the customer better, um, but we have to preserve the privacy of the patient. So that's foremost in, in terms of how we do that. Um, there are different techniques in terms of how we be identifying data as we we look to identify trends and how we can serve the customer better. So um, that is um, that's something we, we we are very protective of with our with our uh, the data we we serve. Yeah, I think we in the U.S. we fulfill 1.2 billion scripts every year. Um, there's a lot of data there, but we have to be careful about the privacy, and that's something we protect very uh, very closely. Right. Um, hi, Anne, I would love to hear from you on this side. So coming through Xbox is clearly quite a bit of information. Uh, gaming is not just about gaming anymore. It's also social media effectively. They're fintechs in some cases. If we look at a company like Roblox where kids are trading millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of coins at that platform. And so there's a lot of data actually running through Xbox. Um, and so when you're looking at all that information how do you decide where Xbox goes in the future? Because like we mentioned earlier, there's kind of a lot of ways that the company can continue to grow um, by expanding further into areas like Zoom, for example, like it could start becoming a company that replaces your, replaces your water cooler talks or it could expand more into, into um, helping kids learn how to code. So can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, I, I, you're totally right. I think, I think gaming is such a, it's such an exciting center to start from and think about how all the ways in the world that we can, um, you know, beyond leisure, think about how we can help people and, um, and benefit even productivity. Um, I would say 
I think at our core, Xbox is a, is a gaming ecosystem, and and right now I think we're we're really thinking about you know during this pandemic, the industry has been hit hard, the games industry. Um, game creation is ultimately a creative activity with um, multidisciplinary teams of designers, engineers, artists, and now having to work remotely. And we know that 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 creative process is super difficult when you're just not face to face, when you're using um, kind of virtual tools be between you and, and also just work from home impact like childcare and mental health on the workforce. So um, I we have really focused on our own teams and sort of, um, you know, spending the first half of last year ramping the teams back up so that we are um, a creative and, and and collaborative team again. And also thinking about the industry and, and helping creators out there to um, meet their vision. So things like, you know, we, we look at the Minecraft marketplace. So anytime that we can create a marketplace in our games where millions of players are engaging, but can also support an ecosystem of um, developers out there. So Minecraft Marketplace last year um, uh, did a billion dollars of transactions um, in support of people who are creating Minecraft content. I mean, that's fantastic. And we want to grow markets like that. And for example, Flight Sim launched late last year. And within Flight Sim, we also built upon the learnings of Minecraft and built a, a marketplace for folks who want to create um, additional content for um, flight sim enthusiasts. So we want to make sure that um, this is a healthy industry. We think we have a key role to play in that. So I, at the moment, that's where we are focusing the use of our data to see how we can um, nurture these different kinds of ecosystems. I think the other piece is that, um, you know, we found that through the pandemic, especially early on, that people's leisure time and their work time started to blend. Whereas previously we would see spikes on weekends of gameplay, everything just sort of leveled out. Um, people would, you know, spend half an hour playing, then half an hour on a Zoom call. Um, and we really recognize that people need these little breaks. Um, at the same time, we know people are spending a lot more time with an hour you know, UI within our operating system. And so we started um, implementing schemes such as uh, donations. So, you know, when you play um, and interact in the ecosystem, you can earn uh, these uh, points, Microsoft rewards, and we allowed um, players to donate those rewards to worthy causes like for COVID relief. And um, uh, this month, for the NAACP and Black Girls Who Code. So we're really trying to find ways to leverage this um, newfound sort of the power of the crowd to do good in the world through our ecosystem as well. Lucinda, That's can, really... I, can I pick up on something high end said there and ask a question to the other uh, people? I think it's something really, you talked about the traditional creative process, product development process being largely multidisciplinary, but all, all built on the premise that we need to be together to create, right? Um, you know, and I know for the first two months of the pandemic, we were scratching our heads thinking, how the hell are we going to do what we're going to do at IDEO? Because we're, ne we're renowned for that. And I have been astounded at the, the shift that we've seen to the point now as an organization where we're beginning to ask a different question is, what's the thing we're not going to go back to, right? And so a couple of things that we found, you know, we see the, the leveling that Zoom has given us, the access to senior leadership that Zoom has given us actually gives us strategic velocity that we didn't have before. It's much easier to make better, more precise decisions this way than it was the way that it was before. Second thing that I've, I've, I've personally uh, seen with our teams is it, it's, it's allowing us to engage in a much uh, broader and more diverse set of perspectives in the work we're doing. So working with the automotive manufacturer we've just talked about, working with some of the large technology companies here in the Bay Area, we're now able to build like a global network of uh, journalists and researchers and photographers that are allowing us to do research and insights to understand what the customer needs. But it removes a bias that I think we had before. 
because it's actually seeing the context through the, through the lens of the people that we're designing with, as opposed to the, through the lens of the designer or the researcher. So we're seeing stuff that we don't want to go back to. And I'd love to understand from Haiyan or Dave and Mike, like, what else are you seeing, right? In terms of ways of working that actually think, think they are better in the environment we're in right now. I think it has been a fascinating change. Um, we have seen something a little bit, and I, I'm amazed at how so many of our employees have been able to shift from the, you know, being in a group and delivering a product together to going and doing it out of their kitchen uh, with the kids or the dog or whoever, you know, the cat walks across the thing, whatever. They've been able to make that work. What we've seen is some interesting response from our clients of saying, okay, this has worked great. In the first couple of months, I was fine, but now they're, they're interested. Okay, we can Zoom, but wouldn't it be nice if we could Zoom in the same time zones? Um, so we've been obviously a, a globally distributed company, but we actually acquired two companies at the end of last year in Latin America. So we could be a little bit more, have a little more proximity a location, more time zones friendly. And we've seen that really resonate with clients um, as they're trying to evolve and innovate on, on, on the products themselves. And, and it's able to let us to really do things from a around the clock perspective, because we can leverage multiple teams, but using Zoom or Google Meet or whatever the right you know tool is to be able to innovate together. It's been a, it's been a change. I'm, it'll keep evolving. Uh, I know we're not done here. It's going to be really interesting. Great. Hi, and did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I, I I mean I agree with um, everything that Ian talked about and Dave as well. You know we um, we're also a global work workforce, even though um, we're headquartered in in Redmond, Washington. Um, I think that uh, working from home and being everybody being remote has definitely built more empathy across the global workforce for time zones, for folks, you know, previously dialing into a conference call and not having their voice heard because they're on the screen. Um, but I think on, on the gaming side as well, uh, for us, we're, we're actually really learning from our players, the power of virtual spaces. Um, so, you know, people going into Minecraft and building out their school campus um, and uh, running graduations uh, within Minecraft, uh, th that the power of these virtual spaces, um, you know, I think we've seen these, these are nascent emerging trends, but at the same time, I think the pandemic's really um, accelerated. And I think there's huge potential to think about, you know, uh, this idea of the metaverse and how we can be more present with each other in a virtual space. Yeah, Second Life, I guess, might get a second coming if anyone still remembers that game. Um, I, I believe we actually have um, a few questions from our audience members, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Andrew for a second. We do. Hello, everyone. Um, so we actually got three different questions that are very related, so forgive me, but I'm going to try to cobble them together into something whole. Um, and by the way, that's from Buzz Brueggemann, Eddie Shutter, and myself. Um, so it's all about changing needs and in a you know fast uh, uh, changing moment, and also limitations and your ability to respond. So Buzz uh, wanted to know how often you survey your customers and how long that takes to translate that input into product results. Okay, so build timelines. Eddie Shutter wanted to know about the external limitations, utility infrastructure, things like that that will hinder your ability to respond. And I wanted to know how customer needs are going to change because of course, once you adjust to their needs today, they're probably gonna change again because we're in a weird moment in time. So build timelines, customer need changes and external limitations. How do you deal with meeting customer needs? I'll try, I'll start at least with the building or meeting customer needs. We, we work with our clients in three different ways. We obviously have very regular communication with them. And we do use your standard NPS surveys. Uh, that's fairly regular. And we do it right or wrong. We do things more verbally uh, just because of the scale of who we are and we build custom products. So trying to do it all digitally doesn't make sense yet. So we're doing that. But we've also started things around what we call our customer innovation score. Where we sit down with our clients and say, are we helping you innovate uh, to get to your solution better? So we're getting that feedback that helps us decide where we can help them from a growth perspective. And then when it, go it goes back a little bit to earlier question Listen, they had around data and security, we have something we call our... Um, engineering health index. So we sit down with our clients every quarter and look at a couple of things like maintainability, reliability, scalability, and security. You know, are we sitting down with them to make sure as they build their product and innovate with and build with them, are we getting that input from them that we're meeting all those things? We have our own, you know, we own rubric on how we score that, but it gets us that constant dialogue with our clients to make sure that we're listening to what they're saying and, and innovating with them and actually making sure they can grow and scale uh, for the next, next releases. 
Yes, Mike, uh, very similar to what David said. We um, just, how, how do we connect on customer requirements and, and customer experience? Um, we have been able to iterate um, quite quickly in these times. Uh, I mentioned some of the capabilities that for a direct response to uh, kind of the changing environment, uh, the lockdowns, the, uh, the different needs that we've seen, which frankly were in the process of changing uh, pre-pandemic, but would just accelerate it as part of the pandemic. Um, we do uh, net promoter scores, so we monitor the feedback uh, that way as well through, as through some intense fo focus groups. Um, so we think we have a pretty strong connection to our end users, our customers. Um, of course, uh, that's, a, that's a bike you never stop pedaling. Uh, you're always trying to explore new ways uh, to understand how you can fulfill the customer better, um, especially against a backdrop that continues to change. Um, so uh, it's been a challenge just, just in terms of, you know, from inception or idea to delivery, we generally, uh, we've got weekly release cycles. Um, so I, I think um, it depends on the size of the idea as you might imagine. Um, but um, I, I've, I've been amazed by our teams. We get back to the kind of the previous topic in terms of how, how does a team that probably worked best together now work uh, even better uh, in a distributed fashion. We moved to these, these collaboration platforms and it was a learning curve, um, but I've seen some amazing things coming out of our, our digital teams. Um, and um, you know, I think it's only gonna get better from here. If, if you'd have asked me this question last year, uh, Lucinda, of like, I, I would have talked about the way in which we work with our customers to understand, well, what is the frequency with which you're actually in conversation with customers? Like what's your mean time between prototypes? What's your mean time between customer interactions? And uh, understanding that too frequent, you get nothing done too long. You get so much of the sunk cost fallacy build, being built into product development that you never make any changes. The thing I'm most inspired by right now is I think a shift that's happening in the design industry and it's gonna filter into the product development industry as well is acknowledging that we've got to move uh, away from designing for people, but designing with people and acknowledging that that means uh, communities of people or councils of people that are actually staying around the product development process, staying around the organizational development for the long term. And it's a, it's a new way, I think, that we're going to need to embrace uh, uh, you know, a shift in design so that we start to remove some of the biases that are inherent in terms of uh, uh, like how we think about serving customer needs. So designing with versus designing for keeps people in conversation pretty consistently. Um, and I think from a gaming perspective and, uh, you know, within, within Xbox and Microsoft, the systems in place to um, uh, work with our users and especially with um, uh, our flight rings, being able to um, uh, implement and deploy surveys very quickly through the UI. You know, it's it's an excellent system, and it's gathering tens and thousands of um, pieces of feedback from our users in real time. And we're able to, um, you know, quickly iterate on um, our user experience and deploy um, new tests all the time. At the same time, I think we have cha different channels for getting feedback. So. Obviously, we have very vocal fans on social media um, and we're, you know, listening to those fans. I would say that some of our biggest challenges is um, having been in this games industry for 20 years, we have a, a, a solid fan base, but how do we reach players that have ne never played Xbox before? How do we reach th those new players? Or how do we reach people that um, might be interested in playing, but, uh, you know, uh, didn't think about sort of being a, a real gamer previously. Um, so for us, the challenge has been, well, how do we reach new people out there? And I think one um, piece of uh, sort of co corporate culture that we have and um, the way that we are tackling this, which I think is very exciting, is being able to kind of experiment in the public eye. So as an example, um, in the past year, we were able to experiment with cloud gaming so we deployed uh, cloud gaming 
um, about a year ago and it was in closed beta. So we just, we launched a web page and we asked um, people to sign on. And um, then we invited people to come in and, and try out this cloud gaming product. And we were able to do that experimentation in the wild um, uh, and learn from that. And then eventually that's now launched into a public beta. Um, but it's just, it's great to see our existing fans be receptive to experiment with us and to be kind of, we've kind of said that the, the folks who signed up to be closed beta users are our founding members of this product. Um, and now we're able to deploy that. And I think in the future, just, I think asking for fans for forgiveness in a way to experiment with us, as Ian was saying, to design with us and, and create these products together um, is, is a great culture to build with our customers, but also internally that we're, we're able to um, sort of be vulnerable like that in, in the, uh, in the um, product sphere. Hi, Ian, that's a great uh, response. And I actually uh, am going to bring up another uh, uh, great question because it relates very much to that. It was from Scott Beckett from earlier. I'm sure you all saw it in the chat about adoption of technology um, where it's hardest and most critical. Uh, he writes, uh, it's a deal breaker in healthcare. What has changed and, and what still has to change uh, in your company's approaches to access? So let, let me go. Um, and I think, you know, we, we serve a rather diverse population. Um, what, you know, in, you know, whether it be the, the, the younger population, which is already probably, you know, on, on the forefront of adopting these technologies to the, to, uh, to the more, to the, to the laggard, so to speak. And there's, there's really no easy answer. Um, I do think certainly that focus on design by persona has been something that we've been very focused on. Um, and we've had to, you know, as you know, I was saying, we have, we've had to experience, uh, experiment in the, uh, in, in the public, which uh, can be good and also be bad when, when you have some challenges like around vaccine scheduling um, and some of the challenges that, you know, that, that presented itself. So, um, you know, in terms of adoption, I think it is about the experience. It's connecting uh, more intimately with uh, the customer needs um, and using uh, these technologies that we have, uh, that immersive experience um, and continue to, to focus on um, what that experience is and how, how to enable them. So uh, it's been a perform uh, persona-based approach um, that, that we've used to um, kind of uh, around, in addition to kind of that mass personalization which I think helps drive that experience, um, so. Mike, I actually wanted to ask you something first um, and sorry if this kind of pivots from that last question, but um, one thing you actually mentioned quite heavily around uh, iterating the product and, and in our conversation is the government and collaborating with the government through all of this and through COVID and um, through uh, rolling out new new products as well. And so how, um, how do you kind of, how are you dealing with that at the moment, right? How are you finding the communication pathways that work the best with them um, in this entire process? Um, so it's, a, it's an ex extremely fluid um, situation. Um, I mean, uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance, I mean, for the folks in the US, you know the Walgreens, but it, they're across 25 countries. Um, and I think everybody knows very, each country is in, in various stages of coping with this pandemic. Um, so in many cases, um, the response that works well in the UK is not the response that works well, for instance, in Spain. So uh, we have some amazing business teams that are connected with the government to really kind of drive that community focused approach. Um, and it's, it's different. Um, now, um, I think in terms, the, the big challenge that we've seen um, is with the government where I'd like to, you know, the government is very focused on the care of the population. Um, as well as distributing the vaccine, kind of how those two come together in terms of uh, the supply chain, but also the reporting against progress on that supply chain. Um, we've seen, um, we've seen uh, you know, that coordinated approach very different by country. Um, and that, I think that's been one of the challenges, but also one of the opportunities. I mean, we're, um, we're on the front lines of that. And um, it's something that uh, we, uh, we, we have a vested interest in, in, in driving for our patients. 
Um, and it's a hard problem, but uh, I mean, that is something that we're 100% invested in. So um, it hasn't been easy, I, I won't share, uh, I, but it has been worthwhile to be, um, to actually be on the front lines of this response. Do you, ex do you expect, uh, do you expect there to be a constant role after this, even post pandemic with oh, sure. people who are going to be as government liaisons effectively because you have to deal with so many different states within the US and also abroad as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I expect with uh, uh, the rollout of the vaccine that um, we'll see this and, you know, we're trying to anticipate and get ready for what next season looks like where you have uh, perhaps the flu, uh, second rounds of, of uh, COVID vaccine distributions. Um, I think that close coordination with the government is, is critical in order for us to take that response to, you know, into our, you know, to our patients. Uh, to our customers. So we anticipate, and we're trying to build agility in terms of the ways of working and how we continue to be connected with that because we, we just frankly don't know. This is agile thinking, um, as you might imagine, um, on steroids. Um, so uh, we're going to continue to, um, you know, continue to ramp into this. We, we believe the challenges will change. I can't tell you if they're going to be higher or lower. I think we're going to continue to be more prepared for that. Um, and our response is going to be stronger going forward. Uh, continue to strengthen going forward on top of an already strong response. Great. And I think we have a constant stream of questions. I'm going to also hand it over to Andrew. We do, and I'm, I'm loving it. So thank you all who, who've submitted your questions either, either publicly or privately to me. Um, you can just call me Mr. Customer Needs because all the questions I keep asking have to do with customer needs. So forgive me, uh, but that's kind of the core of it, right? Um, Michael Chewy from uh, McKinsey wanted to know, what are you learning about customer needs and preferences based on different countries being at very different stages in terms of the COVID situation? Um, so, you know, Asia versus North America and so on and so forth. And, you know, uh, to avoid an awkward silence, Ian, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Um, I'm going to answer slightly differently, but it, it'll get to the point, Andrew, absolutely. So I think IDEO has always thought of itself as a global organization. Um, we have global representation in China, in Japan, in Europe, in North America. I think one of the things that we're realizing at this moment um, is that the markets we're operating within are evolving at a very different rate, right? And that our, we need to respond as an enterprise, as an organization to, to be able to deal with that evolution. Uh, for me, I think about it almost like, um, you know, acknowledging Darwinian's theory of evolution of the finches on the different islands, right? We have a, a team in, in China who have been through the short, shock, the short, sharp shock of the uh, pandemic and are back at work now. They are in offices. They had a, an office opening party with 300 people. They're collaborating in person. It's like there are a lot of standards in place, but it's, it's some semblance of the old normal, right? We have teams in Europe who have ping-ponged between going back to work to then being shut down again to going back to work. And at IDEO in North America, we're, we're, we're looking at how long are we going to be in this status of actually working remotely, working vi uh, virtually, working digitally. And my, my gut tells me we're going to be at least 18 months to two years before we're back to some semblance of being in the office. So our company is evolving differently, right? And the company that's going to come out on the other side of this is going to look quite different in four different places. And I have to believe that um, any company who's thinking and acting with any semblance of a global perspective has to be tuning into this notion right now, that the markets are reacting differently and the markets are evolving differently and the needs of the customers in each of those environments is very different. The only thing I was going to add is that, well, when the majority of our business is in North America, we also do some business in Europe and Latin America. The, the, we also work with a bunch of monthly nationals. I, I, Consistently, we're seeing an increase in urgency. Um, our customer base doesn't feel like they can sit around and wait anymore. Um, whether they know that however COVID goes, they need to be prepared for a multitude of outcomes and they need to be ready for whatever that comes and they can't afford to lose market share at this time. So the, what I've seen change over the last six, nine months is, is the rate of urgency, is, is how, how much our clients want to get involved and get things done. Uh, and just to because they are, they're urgent with working with their clients. Uh, I, I, we don't do any business in Asia, so I can't answer that question, um, but the level of urgency is high. Uh, Dave, I can build back on that. I think this, this, the, the urgency thing is, is really, really important. I think across the board, we're seeing um, all of our customers, our customers at, at IDEO beginning to ask the question of how, 
how we increase our velocity, right? How we actually get faster and do it in a way that is still more thoughtful, like the important versus just the urgent. And for me, I'm beginning to see um, that the reaction to that is in organizations beginning to really embrace much more network-based thinking to decentralize the way that they're actually making decisions and to get much clearer that uh, who has decision space to do what, when, and why, and largely ensuring that that decision space is pushed to the edges of the organization, which is ultimately on, and often the parts of the organization that are in conversation with the customer. So moving away from a model that is traditionally centralized and hierarchical, where we're actually waiting for decisions to come back up the tree to go back down, they might not be relevant anymore, to actually pushing them out into the network and ensuring that people have the, the, the ability to kind of create the urgency and the velocity that Dave's talking about. So Deborah Weinswig asked a, um, uh, a great question that I think is a, is a nice segue from that. Um, and it really cracks it open. So don't laugh too much because I know we're getting toward the end of our time here. But, um, you know, there are a lot of great solutions. Velocity, as, as you mentioned, uh, 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 is, is certainly an improvement. But how do we make sure we design for what people actually need versus what they we think they need? Because feedback is, you know, getting that feedback is more challenging and it's a fast moving uh, environment and, and all of that. And uh, and she was particularly interested in how that applies to gaming. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> um, I think this is a great question. Um, I guess it, just relating back to the previous question, um, I, I think from from our perspective is that you know fundamentally everybody around people play it's a fundamental need that people have always played if we look at video games as a way to address that fundamental need um across the world access is not equal across the board um you know we uh, uh we started out as a console business um, but consoles are not prevalent everywhere. So in India, for example, um, they've almost skipped the console um, technology and gone to mobile. But we do know that in places where there, there aren't necessarily so many consoles, people know about high quality, high end, high engagement games through YouTube, through watching Twitch, through, uh, looking at TikTok. So people know about games, they just can't access those games. And um, it might be a um, uh, lack of access to the technology infrastructure, uh, different kinds of socioeconomic structures that um, prevents them from, you know, being able to get this kind of console and the living room experience. Um, so for us, as, for us to, you know, as we move into the next phases of addressing uh, more of a global audience, and enabling play everywhere is that we we have to be more flexible about our um, uh, business offerings, about our business models, about how um, we go to different countries, um, the offerings that we have, um, and then also making sure that that content um, is suited to different cultures. So I think for us, it's really working with local businesses, local creators, because um, I think ultimately the center of our business is ensuring that um, this industry that the the people who create play that it's a thriving industry wherever that may be in the world so if you're a creator in africa you want to make video games how can we enable you to thrive um and so uh, and, and working with with local creators because local creators know what their customers want um so for us it's just sort of um ensuring their success and listening to those those local creators um, and so I think that's been kind of our strategy working at the global level to find local partners. Now the pandemic has presented uh, many challenges to that in that, you know, we, we had plans to uh, sort of deploy uh, ideas, products uh, more globally and, and sort of they, they've been held back. Um, but, but ultimately I think it's, it's sort of uh, partnering locally is, is very important for us. That actually brings up a really good point, which is also around diversity of the people who are creating the, the products themselves. Um, and so there's statistics that show that companies with more diversity do better. And so I am curious for the five of you here, um, have you kind of been able to find ways to bring in more diverse talent during this pandemic time um, and, and kind of what are the best practices there? 
and I'll gonna I'm gonna start in reverse and have you jump on that high end. Um, oh, thanks, Lucien. It's such a great topic, and it is a top of mind topic within our teams, within how we think about our culture. We we focus a great deal on um, how do we open up our talent pool. How do we um, when we do have openings? How do we um, find diverse talent to um, interview? to be part of those um, those talent pools. At the same time, looking at our diverse talent internally and thinking about the trajectory of um, uh, how do we grow people's careers? How do we make sure that um, uh, people who uh, want to kind of become managers or be uh, become uh, uh, sort of more senior decision makers how do we ensure those those career paths um that all the blockers um are, are removed absolutely i it's just, it's so important and it's so ingrained i do feel a little bit like i'm i so i've been in microsoft about seven years and before that i was an ido with ian for seven years i i feel incredibly lucky to have been in these cultures where diversity has been a forethought has been discussed um and you know previously previous to, to that i was in the software industry where perhaps it was less discussed and i think first i think firstly what's important is having the conversation that acknowledging that we may not that if we don't focus on diversity that the system some of the systems in place in our society uh, may mean that we are going backwards or may not um, may create barriers to um, uh, folks from different um, backgrounds uh, joining our workforce. So I think first and foremost, just being in a culture where you can have an open conversation about it is, is so important. Um, and I think solutions flow from there. And sometimes those conversations are, are very, very tough. Great. So you named dropped Ian, so obviously I have to go to him next, but let me kind of turn the question a little bit for you. Um, it's an interesting time right now in the pandemic, and I think hiring practices were a little different as well. We're, we're a more diverse, well, we are a more um, uh, decentralized workforce now. Work Remote working is more of a thing. That also means that uh, the people that we're trying to hire as well might come often through referrals, and that kind of can reinforce the issue with diversity. And so what can be done at this point to make sure that isn't going to be a problem going forward? Great question. Um, let's start by, by just acknowledging that, 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 that this conversation needs to be active. It needs to be in the middle of organizations and we all need to acknowledge that there's more that we can do, right? Um, and, uh, and also to the original point, Lucinda, that actually a, a more, a, an increasingly diverse set of perspectives and lived experiences and life experiences brought to bear on problems gets to better outcomes. I passionately believe that that is true. Um, I think one of the things that we've, uh, we, a couple of things we've been doing with Inside IDEO, um, really beginning to uh, strip down, take back to the studs, you might say, how we think about the qualities and experiences required of any individual coming into uh, a pipeline uh, for, for a role within the company, right? As a starting point. Um, that, uh, that certainly kind of gets us away from you have to have gone to a certain set of schools, you have to have a certain track record to meet that first pass and really allows us to dive into the, the competencies we want, we want to see in any one individual and allows us to get a little bit further beyond that. But that's not going to fix it, right? We, we've got to acknowledge that um, fundamentally, for, for me, we need to be able to ensure that more uh, kids that are growing up uh, around the world, uh, be it from underprivileged backgrounds or privileged backgrounds, need to see design as a, as a way in which they can make progress and have impact in the world. Um, and uh, that's going to be a fundamental shift that we need to take on as an industry. Um, the, 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 the opportunities I'm beginning to see as a result of the pandemic, though, is it's beginning to fundamentally challenge us to say, what does it mean to be an employee of IDEA? Right, it's, a, it's beginning to actually allow us to, and, and I'm not gonna get drawn into the whole full-time employee versus gig worker debate, because I don't think that's, I think that mischaracterizes it. But it's beginning to allow us to ask, what does permeability look like in our organization? How can we actually bring more, uh, a variety of different perspectives in in different ways? 
uh, not just to tap into different types of communities, but to acknowledge that actually the, um, the relationship you have with any one employer should be malleable, should be permeable. I should be in a learning environment. I should have the opportunity to go back to school and learn, right? And so we're thinking about diversity in, 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 a, in a lot of different ways within the company. Um, and as I said at the, at the top, these are hard conversations and we've all got a lot of progress to make. More accessible education might be helpful as well. Um, and Dave, I've seen you kind of nod along as well in this conversation. Yeah, I mean, this is hard, right? We're all getting better at this. And I like, you know, Ian talked about culture and Ian talked about learning. And I think, it, and to some extent, it's about that openness as a leadership team to say, okay, we, we need to embrace leadership and we have to learn. I mean, sometimes it's those hard conversations with people that have come from different diversities to, to be open to say, hey, this bothered me or I could have done better here or this is how it could help my career. You just have to get at those real human questions that concern so such a high percentage of our, of our workforce. And we all just have to get better at that and understand that we all grow up with a level of bias. It's just reality. But how do we get better at that and work and, and encourage, motivate, and embrace and celebrate those that, that do say, you know, from a diversity perspective, come up and, and really help um, that, that group of people to become more successful and to share and to be open and it's okay to share uh, concerns that might make other people uncomfortable. And Mike, of course, you you must be anticipating at this point. Um, but I, I think, yeah, you're. <laughs> I just went off mute, so um, of course, uh, and I can certainly identify with all the other comments. I mean, I, I think a couple of thoughts. Certainly, this is you know for a company that actually, um, you know, I, I think in the U.S. the stats are that um, seventy percent of the population is within five miles of any Walgreens, right? And I think that's largely true of some of our other geographies. So for a company that serves uh, as we reach into our community, such a diverse population, it makes us better if we re reflect that in our, you know, within our own teams, our own culture. Um, so we, there's certainly recognizing that this is um, an imperative for a company that wants to, to, to thrive, but it's also the right thing to do. Um, I also think with the, with the pandemic, there's been a lot of reflection, right? Um, you know, we've been invited into, you know, you're invited in my home you can see, in a digital way, right? And we've been doing that with our colleagues and you kind of, you know, I think it's made us more human and, and really kind of in tune with our colleagues and what we need to do in order to uh, embrace all ideas, all, you know, to, you know, all the ideas, I mean, a more inclusive culture. So um, it isn't easy, right? We know that, um, you know, particularly in the tech industry, that um, there there is uh, you know you have to you have to lean in in order to um, really diversify your your candidates your you know your pool of candidates. I, I mean, I think at one point we were trying to hire you know out of every ten you get a diverse candidate, but you know two or three. Um, so you have to work harder, but it is so important for us to lean in on this, um, and that's something we've committed to at WBA. So. Um, yeah. Very, very important for us to, 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 you know, not only that deeply human touch and kind of connect and embrace all ideas within your culture, but um, to lean in and make a difference and, and try to move some of the numbers that, um, quite frankly, they aren't where we want them to be and we can do more on. It's a constant, it's a constant learning experience. Um, that said, it's been so great to have you all. We are unfortunately so tight on time that we are at the end and have to start the other fantastic panel. Um, so. Thanks again. We are out of time. Um, want to thank everyone for their perspectives and our audiences as well for the great questions. Um, and our next panel is going to be starting in a few minutes. I will throw it to Andrew. Thanks, Lucinda. And thank you again to our speaker guests, Mike, Ian, David, Hayan. And thanks again to our corporate partner, Three Pillar Global. Um, in just a few minutes, we'll be back with our second discussion of the day, as Lucinda said, focusing on what kind of tech you need and don't need in 2021 with a terrific panel of leaders from Dell, DocuSign, Zooks, KPMG, and Capital One. I'll see you in about three minutes. Don't go away.